May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. One who is next to you right now is your neighbor. I love the cosmos. Well, that's really easy. If you have to just one love, one being, it costs life. Neighbor does not mean somebody who lives next door. Whoever is… whatever is right next to you right now, one who is next to you right now is your neighbor. If Jesus had said, love somebody who is in the other side of the planet, they would have loved them. Go in easy. Your neighbor, he is not good. Isn't it? This moment, whoever is next to you, if you learn to love him, you will become loving by your own nature, isn't it? Yes? Because this moment this person is there, another moment another person is there, next moment an insect is there, next moment somebody is there. If you just learn to love anything that is next to you right now, your nature will become loving. Loving means what? On the level of the emotion, a certain level of inclusiveness, isn't it? Love your neighbor is not easy, it needs transformation, isn't it? Something about you has to change to love your neighbor. To love God, you don't have to change anything. You can bullshit yourself completely. You can bullshit the whole world and still love God. This is just like these days, it's become more fat. Everywhere, especially I find the new age spirituality in the West has taken on this. Oh, I love humanity. I love the cosmos. Well, oh, that's really easy. You don't have to love anybody. If you have to love one individual, well, it costs life. If you have to just one love one being, it costs life, isn't it? I love the whole cosmos, but I can't stand the person who's sitting next to me right now. That's a different thing. Now this is just bullshit, too much of it. Yes? I love the whole humanity. Where did you see the whole damn humanity to love them? No, I just love. Yes, that's very easy. Just try to love one person and see what it costs. So much of you, you have to put it on the ground. So much of you, you have to surrender if you have to love just one person, isn't it? Yes? But I love the whole humanity. This is easy. Someone said, love the neighbor. That's very significant, very significant. Oh, let me check who is my neighbor. That's not the point. Whoever is next to you right now, whatever is in touch with you right now, just to love it indiscriminately. The very air that you breathe, neighbor? Yes? Is it your neighbor? Yes. The water that you drink, neighbor, sitting here, right? Hmm? Is he your neighbor? Yes. The land that you walk on, is he your neighbor? Just to know that whatever is in touch with you right now. Now, this is something else, it costs life, otherwise it won't happen. In United States of America, there is a segment of people who believe that next time when Jesus comes, he will come in United States. Generally, it's believed he will come in Mount Olive in Jerusalem, but now US people are saying, why will he go to Israel? That's not a good place to go he will come in United States. So they asked me a question like this in a large gathering, Sadhguru, what do you think? Jesus will come 
in United States or in Jerusalem? I said, see, last time he came in Jerusalem and he said, come follow me. Only twelve people, hmm? Today you are celebrating him as a great being, but only twelve people followed him. In that one of them freaked on him, all right? But if he comes to United States today, if he says, come follow me, you have a bank loan, student loan, car loan, house loan, holiday home loan, you are mortgage for forty-five years. <laughs> if Jesus says, come follow me, nobody will be there because everybody has to go to the bank. So you have entangled yourself in such a way, even if the most significant things happen, you can't change the direction of your life. Hello? If the greatest things came your way, you cannot change the direction of your life. This is a slave's life, isn't it? What is slavery? He cannot choose. That is slavery, isn't it? Now, you are making that kind of arrangements in your life, you cannot choose, you're stuck in your own arrangements. A spider whips a web for other things to be caught. But if you are that kind of a spider, you build a web in which you are caught, you are a stupid spider, isn't it? And most human beings are in that condition. <laughs> if something significant happens here, you are going this way, if something really significant happened this way, you can go this way, your arrangements will not trap you. This is an intelligent life. If you are smart enough, you will make arrangements that support you, not arrangements that entangle you, isn't it? Jesus said, if someone slaps you, turn and show the other cheek. Is such a teaching relevant today? See, Jesus might have said that too, he's the twelve people who are, the, who are around him. That's not a general teaching. To his apostles, people who carry his message, he's telling them, if somebody slaps you one side, show them the other cheek. He's not telling that to the whole world. That man, if the way he lived, he's not the kind to show another cheek. He comes into the temple and throws out all the business. So he didn't say, okay, you got one, one shop here, keep another shop there. Did he say that? Physically, with bare hands, he's destroying their business, isn't it? He's not the kind of man who'll show his other cheek to everybody. He's telling his apostles, if you want to carry my message, you must be like this. No resistance in you, no matter what people do, you don't deviate from your path, you just stick to your path, that's all he's telling you. Because these cultures are very dialectical, everything is said with an example or a, a kind of, you know, uh, an analogy. He is saying that if somebody slaps you on one cheek, show them the other, don't deviate. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, if you try to slap him on the other cheek, on his cheek, then you're deviating from your path of peace and love, isn't it? So he's saying, do not deviate from your path, just stick to your path, no matter what somebody does. All he's say, telling you is, do not become a reaction in your life. If you want to accept, if you want to act in your life, you should not react. If you react, you will get enslaved to somebody else, you'll go behind those people. So he's just telling you, do not react. That's his way of saying it. So that's not to be taken literally. His life demonstrates he didn't take it literally, isn't it? In the all-new series, The Truth About Jesus on Sadhguru Exclusive, find out more about the intriguing birth, life and teachings of this wonderful being. Get a yogic perspective on whether Jesus was really born to a virgin and Sadhguru's insights about the teachings of Jesus. Is such a thing possible? It could have been initiated by these three people. If you do not create genetic distance, the old cycles of patterns will take effect whether you like it or you don't like it. This is the most beautiful story about him, that he was an immensely joyful and loving human being. So Jesus versus yoga <laughs> No, no, he is my party. Now I don't see him as anything. Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful, but not a good man. If you don't let that man rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. That part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it.
whatever we are referring to as Jesus is not about some man two thousand years ago, it's about a certain possibility within every human being. So that has to rise. It's not that there is no Jesus in you, it's just you kept him hung, impotent. He needs little empowerment, he needs to be raised. So the whole effort is that part of you which we can call Jesus or Shiva or whatever you like, to allow that to rise. Can you say Shiva is a good man? No, but he's fantastic. Even Jesus, not a good man, wonderful, not a good man. Anybody who disturbs the existing situation is not a good man, isn't it? Yes or no? In any given situation, someone who disturbs your family situation, somebody who disturbs your social situation or political situation, national or international situation, is not a good man in that society, isn't it so? So Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful but not a good man. Shiva definitely not a good man, but fantastic he is. If you don't let, let that man rise within you, if you do not let that aspect rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. Dead is good, dead is always good. Yes or no? Once it happened, a five-year-old boy and his mother went to the cemetery. He had never seen a cemetery in his life, this is the first time. The mother was dedicated to one particular grave, she sat down. The boy went about everywhere, reading all the inscriptions on the tombstones. He went through the whole cemetery, read everything and came back to his mother and asked his mother, Mom, where do they bury all the horrible people? <laughs> Every tombstone says this was the most wonderful man. Dead is always good, isn't it? Dead is good, living is trouble. <laughs> because living is trouble, we reduced the living to half dead. Fifty percent life is safe, that's where most people have settled. We must decide, dead or alive, half dead is not good, isn't it? Once Shankaran Pillai was arrested for mixing horse meat in chicken cutlets and selling. So when he went uh, to the court, there was nothing else to do, so he pleaded guilty. And they asked, how much horse meat and chicken meat, how did you do? He said, fifty-fifty I did. So he got some fine and some kind of thing and then he came out. His friend asked him, what did you mean by saying fifty-fifty? He said, one horse, one chicken <laughs> That's fifty-fifty <laughs> So this mixture won't work, you have to raise the dead, you really have to raise the dead, that part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it.